All right, I show we're at the top of the hour. Welcome everybody to Season 2, Episode 13 of Net DevOps Live. Today we'll be diving deep into container networking, and joining us today is Matt Dash Two or Matt Johnson, my go-to guy in DevNet for all things cloud, microservices, and container. And he's put together one heck of a deep dive session into container networking for us today. As always, if you have questions during today's session, please feel free to use the Q&A panel. We'll be monitoring that throughout today's session. And if you're looking for the webinar resources, they're posted up on NetDevOps Live under the webinar resources for today's episode. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Matt. If you can start sharing and uh, take us away. Thank you very much, Hank. And hello, everybody. Um, real pleasure to be here with you uh, to close out season two of NetDevOps Live. Um, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm a developer advocate with Cisco DevNet. Um, and yeah, I kind of dabble in all things Linux and containers and networks. So uh, hopefully you uh, guys and girls will find this interesting. So today, my one and only real aim is to completely debunk this, you know, the myths, the legend, the complexities of container networking and to show that actually under the hood, um, it really isn't that scary. Um, it's very common building blocks that once you understand the process, um, pretty much all the extra layers that we're starting to see appear in containers and um, you know the container ecosystem are actually very, very simple additions, uh, just like you might see on your uh, traditional enterprise or data center networks today. So with that said, let's jump straight in. So many of you will be familiar with the fact that Linux can operate as a software switch or a router. I'm British, but router, router, take your pick. Um, you know, most of us, if you've used Linux in the past, and Windows has very similar features with being able to create things like software bridges across two interfaces. You, you're probably familiar with IF config um, on Linux to kind of look at the interfaces, maybe physical, maybe virtual. As I said, create some layer two bridges, um, create some layer three interfaces, um, view a static routing table, or maybe even install an open source routing protocol implementation uh, like Quagga or Zebra um, to allow you a Linux uh, machine to give and receive routes over a number of routing protocols. Uh, most of you will be familiar with OSPF, BGP, etc. Um, carrying on this networking theme, obviously IP tables, the built-in Linux kernel firewall, allows you to filter traffic, um, do stateful firewalling, uh, allows you to do NAT, both source destination, um, one-to-many using ports and PNAT, etc. And there's also things like QOS with the uh, TC command set that lets you do, uh, again, software-based kind of hierarchical QOS implementations. So most of us will be familiar um, that Linux can do that. If you are getting into containers uh, and you've never kind of used Linux or looked at Linux networking interfaces, um, it's definitely worth kind of taking a, a bit of a tour through some of the you know basic Linux networking documentation that will really help understand what's going on. But if you are familiar with those things, um, container networking should be an absolute doddle for you. So, as I said, Linux, um, here are some interfaces, IP address list in a Linux box, and we can see we have our loopback, we have a physical Ethernet zero, which has an IP address, um, and we have some other interfaces, which I'll come on to in a little bit. Now, I will just say at this point, all the kind of demos I'm going to show you are on a real Linux VM uh, running Ubuntu, uh, currently hosted in uh, Linode in a London data center, uh, one of my dev boxes. The reason I'm not doing this directly on my Mac, even though I have Docker installed on my Mac, the reason I'm not doing it on a Windows machine, even though you can have Docker installed on a Windows machine, is anything non-native Linux when you install Docker, uh, which is the kind of container engine we're going to use today, what is actually happening is the Docker installation is creating a tiny um, Linux VM uh, running on your system. Because traditionally, all the Docker and the container toolchain uh, is built for Linux. A lot of the way the networking works under the hood, which we're going to dive into, is based on Linux. So it's much easier to do this on a real quote-unquote Linux system um, than to try and highlight which bit is Mac, which bit is the secret Linux VM that Docker installs on the Mac, etc. Um, hopefully, you know, that this should really aid our learning 
Um, you can get to this information on, on Docker for a Mac, uh, but it's, it's just more complex because you've got extra layers of abstraction. So sticking with Linux on Linux for the time being, um, and I'll cover kind of native um, Windows containerization a little bit later on. So here we go. Um, as I said, the, the basic layer two thing we can do uh, with a Linux box is we could create two uh, dummy kind of loopback style virtual interfaces on Linux, and we could create a new um, layer two software switch, a bridge, um, and then we could add those two interfaces to the bridge, um, and we'd have basically created ourselves a, a little software switch with two interfaces. Uh, and we will see this quite often um, as I switch over to kind of my terminal here and we'll kind of step through some of the scripts. I've scripted this to make it easier to present um, and also so that you can all take this GitHub repository afterwards and play around with the same commands rather than having to see what I'm typing on the screen and kind of type it yourself. Um, so we'll step through quite a few of these examples and then just run the scripts here uh, instead of you watching me type hundreds of boring commands. So simple demo here. I will just authenticate for the hopefully last time. And you'll see we're creating sudo IP link, Linux simple IP toolset to do pretty much everything with um, interfaces on Linux. I will add a software uh, loopback style interface. I'll add another one. I'll set them to up. Uh, we will then create a bridge, demo bridge one, and we will add our interfaces to that bridge, which we can see has been done here. And we can see now this bridge is tracking which MAC address is on which virtual port of this virtual switch. And we can also give the bridge um, a BVI in kind of, you know, Cisco networking terms, a, a layer three interface. So if I do an IP address list of demo bridge one, we can see there that we've given it an IP. And this would potentially be your, um, your default gateway for any of these, anything attached to these, uh, these interfaces. So what we effectively have is a switch. Um, and we've created kind of these two dummy interfaces, but if they were real interfaces, say ETH1 and ETH2, you could effectively plug um, two other clients or laptops or whatever you wanted into those machines, and they would be able to talk to each other, uh, providing you gave them an IP address on the same network. If you gave them an IP address on the 172.1601.24 network, they'd obviously be able to ping the uh, BVI we've just added to the software bridge as well. And, you know, if we then added some NAT and some um, routing, it's very understandable that we could have two uh, clients and this Linux host could be a router for uh, accessing the internet out of our real ETH0 interface, which has a real route to the internet. Um, and this would be great. These two separate devices we've plugged in um, could access the internet and, you know, each other, and we've created a network. And that's great, but we're not talking about external things here. We're talking about containers, which are living in the host itself. So what we really want to do is we want to kind of add a container to a bridge. We like the idea of the bridge. We can NAT out onto the internet. Uh, we can add a load of containers under the same subnet. They can all see the BVI of the bridge as the gateway. That seems like a good way of networking containers. Um, but we need a way of adding the containers um, to that bridge. So if we go and have a look at a regular Docker installation, okay, and once again, I've scripted this so you can play along at home. It, I already have Docker installed on, on this machine. Um, like I said, the container engine we're going to be using. And if I run these commands, I'm going to have a look what other bridges we already have on the system. And as you can see here, not only do we have the demo bridge we've just created, but we also have a bridge called Docker Zero. Um, and I don't have any containers at the moment, so I don't have any interfaces on that Docker Zero, but it's very obvious to see that Docker Zero has an IP. Um, it's in the ruining table. So it has 172.1700/16. So it looks like we're onto something with these bridges. It looks like this is how Docker is going to um, is going to network these devices. So what I'm going to do is just very quickly uh, create a container. I'm just going to spin up a, a completely blank um, Ubuntu container. 
I'm going to send it to the background and tell it to sleep because we don't want a shell, which is what happens by default when you spin up a, an Ubuntu container. Helps if I sudo, doesn't it? There we go. Okay, so if I do a Docker PS, we have... This is why I scripted most of the demos. Um, here we go, we have one container. So if I now go back and run that same set of um, that same set of commands again, you know, let's see our bridge. We still have our Docker Zero bridge, but this time we do have an interface in it, which is interesting. And that interface is a VETH interface. So let's introduce VETH uh, as an interface type in Linux, because this is really there's two parts to the magic of container networking. This is the first one. Um, a VETH is very, very simply a virtual Ethernet device um, that you can create in Linux in software, and they're always created in pairs, and what goes into one end comes out the other. It's as simple as that. So we have this pair of interfaces that we can create with this command here, IP link add, give the first one a name, give the second one a name, and whenever packets are transmitted into either of these interfaces, they immediately appear at the other side. And if you want to read more, um, the link from where I stole this lovely description is available. So, we now know that we can add these VETH pairs into a bridge because they're just a regular interface. So, let's give that a try. I will quickly show you the script before anything else. So here we go, straight from the documentation. I'm creating a pair called pair1 with an A and a B um, interface because they're created in pairs. I'm actually creating two of them, but we're only going to use the first pair. We're going to set the links up so the Ethernet interfaces are up and we're then going to add these interfaces to our demo bridge that we created previously. We're then going to give the second side of the pair, so the bit that would be our container, um, an IP on the same network as our BVI, which was uh, .1. And then we're going to have a look at that, that bridge interface. So here we go. So there we go. We've created a new pair. I'm showing the B part that we've assigned the, uh, that we've assigned the IP address to here. And we can see that the A part is now a member of our layer 2 bridge and therefore can access the layer 3 BVI we've assigned to that bridge at dot one. And if we then have a look, just for completeness in the slides, you can see that if we were to do a TCP dump on the bridge interface, not the A side of the pair, but the bridge itself, because that part A is now part of that bridge, and we try pinging from the B interface, we can see the traffic from that ping generated on the B interface hitting the bridge. So we know that we have communication there from the B interface, which will hopefully be our container, into the bridge itself, and therefore we can get to the gateway, and therefore we can do all the fancy networking that is fairly self-explanatory. So we've got a bridge, and we can get to the, from, from this part B, we can get to the V, if, therefore the bridge, and therefore any of the hosts, routing and, and etc. Okay, so that's all well and good, but if we actually go and look at our host, and look at all the interfaces. Pair 1A and Pair 1B are still just sat there on my host. Like, how do I get those into my container? Like, what is the container from a, a Linux networking standpoint? How do I put this B interface into this container so that the container has it rather than them both just sitting on host A doing nothing, kind of routing traffic to each other? And this is the second part of the magic of Linux containers. Um, I want to introduce something called Linux Network Namespaces. Uh, and again, kind of stolen from the internet, a Linux Network Namespace is logically another copy of the Linux networking stack. It has its own roots, its own firewall rules, and its own network devices. Doesn't that sound familiar to something? Doesn't that sound like something we all know and love in networks, which are VRFs, which is described as from Wikipedia, a technology that allows multiple instances of a routing table to coexist within the same router at a time. One or more logical or physical interfaces may be assigned to a VRF. So a Linux namespace you can effectively think of, a network namespace, you can effectively think of as a, a VRF within a Linux host. So let's explore that. What we're basically saying is we now know that 
we can have these pairs of interfaces and because these are always in pairs and what goes in one comes out the other means we should be able to move the B side of the pair into um, a Docker container so that within this VRF that this container is within um, there is a, a path out which ends up in the host's networking stack but the container itself because it's its own VRF can only see this B side of this paired interface um, that we've given it. So let's investigate. So this script gets a little more complex, but again, these are all linked at the end, they're on GitHub. Um, I've described things on the terminal as we go so that we don't lose track. Um, so there's a tool in Linux called List Network. Uh, namespaces, so LSNS. And as you can see, um, we limit it to the type network. There's other namespaces. You can have namespaces in Linux which isolate file mounts. You can have namespaces which isolate processes, which is actually how containers work from the process side rather than the network side. But we care about these network namespaces, this ability of the Linux kernel to basically create VRFs. Um, and so we can list these, and we can see that there's always going to be a couple, there's always a default VRF um, on a host, you know, on a networking device. Same with Linux, um, these are the default VRFs. And you can actually see we already have one for that um, container we created earlier. So when I created the demo container um, to show that we had an interface in the Docker Zero bridge, you can actually see that that's created a VRF for us. So now what we're going to do is create two containers. And you can see here uh, we're just doing simple docker run, we're calling them container1, container2, Ubuntu latest again, and we're making them sleep and backgrounding them so we don't have to care about them for the time being. So now we've created those two containers, you can see we actually have another two VRFs, two network namespaces, um, one for each of these new containers. Now the Ubuntu docker image um, from public docker hub that I'm using here doesn't have things like ping, and doesn't have things like the IP um, command line available inside them. So what I'm going to quickly do is run these exec commands within our containers um, to just quickly install those tools um, to make kind of stepping through the networking side easier. So this is within the containers and it's installing the IP root 2 toolset which gives us that useful IP command um, and a couple of other utilities. So now within the containers I can actually run IP address list and IP root list. And you'll see container one, what we have is a loopback. And then we have this single Ethernet zero interface. And that's been given an IP on the same network as the Docker zero bridge uh, from the host. And again, container two, different IP also on the Docker zero bridge um, and a single ETH zero interface. Notice you cannot see any of the host interfaces. You can't see Docker Zero. You can't see the two dummy interfaces we created before. That is because th these containers are created in their own network namespace. So this, this VRF principle should be, if you've used VRFs on routing and switching devices, um, you should be fairly familiar. We can now only see the interfaces within this VRF. So this was done by using docker exec to literally run CLI commands um, within the container and output the results onto a terminal. Um, we can also see the same through the host's uh, Linux network NS tools. So you see down here um, there's a tool called NS enter and that basically allows you to jump into the shell of a network namespace um, but still using the tools from the host. So for example, if we didn't have ping, if we didn't have IP address list installed, instead of going and corrupting your container by actually installing some of these debugging tools, um, NSN will actually allow you to run those commands um, from the system, but against the network namespace you choose. The only thing is, instead of naming a container, because um, it's not just Docker that can use network namespaces, it's potentially any um, Linux process, you could do some custom stuff outside of containers, um, the nsenter command requires you to tell it the namespace based on a process ID. So any process ID, just like you'd see in kind of PS on Linux, um, and the way we get the process ID for 
a Docker container is with this Docker command here. Docker inspect, name our container, and we want the state.pid. So we're getting that as container1.pid. We'll show you that actually that is exactly the same container pid as we see in PSOX by finding it in that list. And then nsenter allows us to run pretty much the same commands we did through docker exec. But again, you can do this without needing to exec into the, contain the docker container or install any tools. So it might be a useful avenue as well. And there you see we've got the pid of the container from this command. We can see it's exactly the same as the pid in psorx here with the command we started the container with. And then what we actually care about, listing the addresses, and it's the same. We only see um, what that container's VRF wants us to see. There's only one route because there's only one interface. So we are all good there. So that we know that's how it works. So we've seen VEs. We know that one half of the ETH stays on the um, host networking VRF, the default VRF, and the other is magically at this point put into our container VRF. And that is literally all there is to it. VEs and uh, network namespaces are the complexity within container networking. Once you understand that, and we'll build on this now, um, you'll realize that pretty much everything else kind of falls in place within your standard networking knowledge. So let's mess with the defaults. Let's have a look what we can do um, with Docker's networking. So instead of having Docker automatically create me a new VRF, a new network namespace, and isolate itself, and it's clearly creating me those virtual interfaces as, we, as we've seen, um, we can actually just ask Docker to create as a container using the host's default namespace. So don't create a new namespace, don't create a new VRF, create me the container for process isolation, but attach it to the default network namespace on that system. So as you can see, we've now created a new container uh, three seconds ago, and this is just running the docker ps command. There we go. And then if we list our network namespaces again, you'll see even though we have a new container, we don't have a new network namespace. It's not created as a new network namespace. So once again, let's go and install the um, IP CLI tools into container three, um, just so we can do things like Docker exec, um, IP address and IP list. As I said, you can do this through NSenter, but it's really here for more completeness if you wanna play around with some of these commands afterwards. Always typical, isn't it? You do this on a cloud hosted machine to make sure your local bandwidth isn't an issue. It runs beautifully quick all morning through rehearsal and then here we go, it's taking a little bit of time but hopefully it's not too big a package. There we go. I feel like I should have like some hold music at this point. Hank, I'm sure you can uh, edit this out in the YouTube video, just like, do, 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 something like that. Anyway, um, there we go, back to our uh, list. We now have the IP root tool set installed, wonderful. So if we do an IP address list and an IP root, uh, you can see that we now suddenly see everything on our host. So this container is running in the default network namespace. It can literally see the Docker Zero bridge, it can see the real ETH0 on the host. Um, it can see the bridge test interfaces we created at the start of this talk. Um, and it can see the default routing table as well. So if we ping um, outbound at this point, we are taking exactly the same default route, the physical host's ETH0. Um, there is no difference in the networking here from things we're running within this container to things that we're running natively on the command line of host A um, because we've put it in the default network namespace. Equally, we can also tell Docker that we don't want any networking at all. Create a namespace, create a loopback interface because that's kind of, you know, expected on, on all Linux systems. Linux gets a bit annoyed if it can't find a, a loopback um, loop network interface. 
uh, for a load of its internal processes. Um, but we can literally say to Docker using network equals none, rather than our previous example, which was network equals host, um, we can say, hey, create me a container called container4, uh, again, the same Ubuntu image, with no networking at all. So we'll do that. And again, you'll see that we don't have, um, we have an extra network namespace, sorry, um, because we need a network namespace to put that loopback interface into. Um, but there is no external connectivity. So there's not very many easy ways to show this because we won't have any internet connectivity to install ping and to install IP root and all those other commands we've been installing. Um, but we can kind of find things in the Linux file system like propnet route, um, which will output uh, the routing table, which will be empty. And we can also use this nsenter tool to prove that you can use nsenter to run things that aren't in the container. So I can do nsenter and run a command like ifconfig, which we'll do here. And you can see that the routing table is completely empty, and the only interface we have on ifconfig is our loopback interface. So no networking at all. And because there's no magic to these containers, it's just Docker doing these VEs and these bridges and moving things into namespaces for us, I thought it'd be really fun to do this manually and to create networking for this container in exactly the same way the previous ones have, um, but with manual steps and using the Linux um, commands. So you can see them all here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new VE pair called manual A and manual B. We're going to set them up online and then we're going to add manual A to the Docker Zero bridge, Docker's uh, layer two switch. So let's do that first. And you can see not only do we have the ones Docker, the um, virtual ethernet pairs, one side of the pairs that Docker's created for the other containers for us, we now have this horribly messy manually named one um, that we've created and added to the bridge. So at this point, we can now move manual B, which is currently sat by default in the host's default network namespace, we can move that into container for as network namespace. Now, won't bore you with it, please do go and, and play with these scripts afterwards, um, but where the tools for moving interfaces across namespaces expect to find a list of namespaces, Docker typically doesn't actually put its network namespace items in that directory, so Linux doesn't see by default um, these network namespaces for these containers when using um, the, the Linux command line tools. So what we do here is we basically make that correction, we link um, the network namespace file into where um, the Linux tools are expecting to see them, which means we can now use this command. IP link set, specifying the interface name, and then I'm saying I want this interface to be in this network namespace, and I'm referencing the container network namespace. So, and then we can also use IP net NS exec once we've fiddled around with the CLI fix um, to name that namespace by its container name and actually run networking commands on that namespace, on that VRF. So we do this and we'll see that we've basically moved manual B into this container. So now instead of just having loopback, we have loopback and we have this manual B interface. And if we go to the host, we do IP address list, uh, you will see that we do not have manual B listed because it's not in the default VRF anymore, not in the default namespace. We've moved it into container for its namespace. So what we can then do is we can manually assign an IP address on the Docker zero subnet, which is 172.17.16, um, with, again, using the IP net NS exec commands to make things happen within the container for a network namespace. So we bring the interface up, we'll give it an IP, we'll give it a default root of the Docker zero uh, BVI. There we go. And then at this point, that's all Docker should be doing for us when it's creating these interfaces. So we should have enough internet connectivity to then do apt update, apt install, and then try pinging uh, the real world from within our container. So again, we're using docker exec here, so no funny business with IP net and S. We're literally executing these directly in a shell on the container. 
and there we go. This would have already failed um, if we didn't have networking. So this is now downloading from package repositories ping, and we can see that ping is successful um, out to Google, and that's because we have this default route that we added and also our interface on a compatible IP within the Docker Zero subnet. So hopefully that kind of shows really what the, the only important things to grasp with container networking, um, that there's nothing magic. It's regular VEF pairs, which you may or may not have heard of before, um, talking to regular layer two bridges, uh, which are done in software on the Linux host. Um, and you know that script is there for you to show that if you want to do all of the container networking manually yourself, instead of having the Docker uh, setup do it for you, you can, and it works exactly the same. Um, obviously their names are a bit more intricate and dynamically generated, but hopefully that, that really kind of explains the, the fundamentals of container networking. There's really nothing to it. Um, a couple of things to cement your understanding. When we were saying, hey, give me a host network, dash dash network equals host, to get the default namespace, um, when we were using dash dash and network equals none to say don't give us networking, um, they are basically words understood by Docker's networking driver. So if you do sudo docker network ls, it will tell you what networks you can use. By default, you get a bridge, which is why we see that VE into that Docker zero bridge. But I asked for host, which will by default use a different backend driver to connect that container to the host network as we saw, and then a null driver does nothing as you can imagine, which is why we got no networking when I asked for dash dash network equals none. Um, and these drivers are pluggable, and we'll cover this um, in a moment. These are basically what commands Docker is running in the background for us. So all those IP, you know, move this interface to this network NS, um, create two new VEF pairs, that is all happening. Those commands are being run uh, effectively just by Docker internally with one of these drivers, depending on what you, um, what you ask for the networking when you create a container. You can actually create a new Docker um, bridge-based network. So you can see here I created one called bridge with Docker network create. Um, and if I do a BRCTO show, you'll see that I now have my Docker zero bridge and a new bridge. Um, and the Docker Zero had a subnet of 172.1.7 slash zero. Um, my new bridge, it's basically just created me a new subnet. So if I go and do a Docker networking ls, oh, Docker network ls, sorry. Sudo, you can see there's my test bridge um, and I can do a Docker network inspect sudo's really killing me today isn't it there we go and it will tell me that it's assigned slash 18, uh, 18 slash 16 for this subnet so they don't conflict um, so it's created me a new bridge and if I do a brctl uh, show don't think I need yet there we go we can see my new bridge there with no interfaces in it so I could happily create a container now and I could do dash dash network equals test um, and it will go into this network so let's give that a try there we go and I'll just do don't care what this uh, container is called so we won't name it explicitly but if we do that and then we have a look at the RCTL we can see that that's the first the VETH Docker's put into our new bridge um, and that container will now have a dot 18 IP address uh, instead of a dot 17 from the Docker zero bridge So the only thing we haven't covered is the fact that I was successfully able to ping 8888 from when we manually networked our container. And in fact, I was able to ping 8888 from all these other um, containers we've created as well, if you wanted to. Uh, you can see here, I've done a trace route. Um, it goes through my Docker Zero BVI, my layer three interface, uh, and I quickly get out to Google's DNS at 8888. So, we have a bridge, that's standard networking. We're on a host with ETH0 on a separate, uh, also private IP address. Anyone want to have a guess what's happening? I know you can't answer me, it's a webinar. Um, but most of you will probably have guessed it. Yes, it's basically simple NAT. 
Um, when you install Docker, when Docker creates its default Docker Zero, or when you create any new Docker bridge style networks, um, there is basically a source path rule which is masquerading anything from the Docker Zero um, subnet anywhere other than the Docker Zero subnet is going to masquerade via the default route. So we are doing standard natting using IP tables um, and you can see it's done the same for the new 172 slash 18 uh, sorry 172 16 network that we created when we asked Docker for a, a new network called test. Um, so yeah again nothing complex you probably imagine that we already have the um, we already had the, the bridge, it's already a simple networking construct, um, very easy to see why we then want to nap that out for default internet connectivity um, of our real interface on the host. Um, IP tables is pretty common, everywhere you will see containers um, on Linux, certainly, and as I said, if you're using Docker on Mac, if you're using some versions of Docker on Windows and running Linux containers, it's actually just a Linux VM behind the scenes, so everything I'm talking about here applies in exactly the same way. Um, if traffic you're debugging or trying to understand in a container environment, if it's getting into, out of, or through some network with an IP address that is private but it's somehow still getting to the web, or a service is being exposed on a port you didn't expect, um, chances are Docker or whatever container solution you're using is adding some form of DNAT, SNAT, um, IP table rules in the background for you. So for example, um, you can actually tell Docker that I want port 8000 on my physical device, on my real host A, to be passed forward into my container on port 8000 with this P command mapping. Um, so instead of the container only being available on this internal Docker zero IP, this would let anyone hitting my ETH0, my public IP, access a service running in my container on port 8000. And you'll see when I do run a container like that, and I go and look at my IP tables NAT rules, um, once again, surprise, surprise, it's just added a simple NAT rule, des destination NAT, TCP, destination port 8000, to our internal container IP, which is routed via that uh, Docker 0 BVI, on to 8000. So again, even inbound services, nothing special. Uh, it's a mixture of Vs, bridges, network namespaces, and IP tables. Not only is it used for kind of exposing and natting internet connectivity, um, pretty much everywhere you will see containers in Linux, you will also see it used for security. So we'll cover this slightly more in a moment. Um, but don't be surprised to see a load of added stuff from Docker or Kubernetes or whatever container solution you're using, um, spitting things all over your IP table rule sets and creating new chains um, to enforce either this container cannot talk to this container or this container can only access the web on these ports. Um, also, you see here there is a rule uh, inbound to allow the um, exposed port 8000 I was talking about. So you will see containers use this for uh, IP tables for security and for natting out of you know simple topologies um, where you haven't specifically given Docker a, a set of public IPs to use. Talking of giving it a set of public IPs, this is all well and good on your host. If you're on one host, that's pretty much all there is to default Docker networking. Um, wouldn't be very useful if things were just on one host. Generally, if we're running containers, we're probably running a cluster um, of containers across multiple hosts, be it bare metal or VM, it doesn't really matter. The point is you're probably going to want resiliency. So you're going to want your containers running in more than one place and you know outside of more than one VM or one physical machine's failure domain. Um, so we do need to look at multi-host. Now, as we've already kind of demystified, the containers in a VRF with a connection to the host via a bridge, the bridge has an L3 BVI, you know, how would you make it multi-host? Um, the foundations of container networking are quite simply normal networking, uh, so it should be fairly easy to see what we could do to make containers on host A be visible and be able to speak to containers on host B. So for example, we could very, very simply have a layer two VLAN. Um, we could create a VLAN interface on our physical ETH0. 
we could create the same VLAN interface on physical ETH0 here if we share a, um, you know, direct L2 connectivity. And we could then have that VLAN interface directly in this Docker Zero bridge. Um, sure, that might cause some issues with, you know, where is our L3 BVI? If it's over here, all of these containers are hairpinning through host A for internet connectivity or indeed to access anything not on the same layer two fabric. We'd be creating one massive broadcast domain, probably fine with two hosts, but what if we had a hundred hosts in this cluster? And also IP addressing, where would we um, where would we get our IPs for our containers from? We'd need some kind of central state to make sure that we weren't assigning a container on host A the same IP address as a container on host B. Um, so that might not be the best way. So maybe we don't do layer two, maybe we do layer three. Maybe we uh, just install routes to each host that we change the um, we change the subnet that host B's Docker Zero bridge works on, or we create ourselves our own Docker bridge, like you saw, I called it test. It had 172.18 slash 24, and then we say on host A routing table, hey, 172.18 slash 16, sorry, is via 10.10.0.2. Um, uh, I've carbon copied these, obviously, those two hosts shouldn't have the same IP addresses. First bug, let me know if you find any more. Um, so yeah, we could we could do standard layer two uh, layer three routing. Um, if we had a thousand machines uh, instead of two, it's going to get a bit annoying to keep manually keeping the routing table so that every host knows about every host and manually remembering which subnet we've given to each um, Docker bridge. So we might want to install uh, a routing protocol. We might want to allow it to kind of advertise the routes to our other nodes for us. Um, and even if we don't have direct access down here, um, you know, standard networking rules apply. We could do VLAN in VLAN um, if we wanted to kind of do some multi-tenancy across different Docker bridges without messing with the physical network layer. We could do GRE tunnels. We, we could do all kinds of regular encapsulation because we're just dealing with standard Linux networking. And obviously, I'm not suggesting you go and kind of implement any of these on your own. Um, the container community is um, established enough that there are many solutions available. And so Flannel is one example of a solution. Calico, Weave, Contiv ACI we'll cover in a bit more detail. Um, but let's take Flannel, for example. Flannel is um, very simply a small piece of software you put on both of your hosts and it connects to a shared database so that every single node running this little flannel networking agent knows about every other node through the shared database. And what that then does is automates the adding static routes um, between your hosts for you um, and also configures Docker to make sure that each of your hosts Docker Zero bridge has a different subnet so you're not doing any um, IP collisions across your hosts. So what you end up with is that scenario where each host has a route to each other Docker Zero and each Docker Zero has got its own IP uh, subnet, so happy days um, and Flannel is one of the simplest ways to solve that for you. Um, and it's literally just inserting and changing everything that we do normally, um, adding and deleting routes um, in an automated fashion. So there's also one called Weave Mesh. Um, it's different from the most of the rest because it does not need this centralized state store that's usually etcd or some kind of object store that has to be hosted somewhere. Um, it's worth mentioning because it doesn't need that, but it does need direct L2 connectivity between all the nodes and it basically does its own advertisement to make sure that without state it can communicate between all of them and set up the relevant, uh, relevant routes. So um, you can see here for Flannel, there's a couple of recommended backends and one size doesn't fit all. Obviously you won't just find the container network solution, um, Flannel, Calico, Weave, you know, part of it is because products and selling support, uh, making a business out of it, but the other part because not all networks are the same. You might not have layer two access between your hosts. You might not have um, the ability to use any port outbound in a particularly secure environment. So you might need to tunnel over UDP or something like that to enable the connectivity between your container hosts. 
Um, these are the recommended backends for Flannel, which are built into Flannel. Um, link is there if you want to read more. Uh, but VXLAN basically encapsulates the packets using the Linux kernel's VXLAN driver um, over UDP uh, between the hosts. Um, also kind of uses the state store to make sure that it knows where to route that VXLAN encapsulated UDP packet so it goes directly to the host that it's destined for. Um, and then host gateway, a simpler version um, if you have direct access, you know, they're all on the same subnet, they all have reachability. Um, it does exactly what we were just talking about. It creates default IP routes between the hosts and make sure that the Docker Zero um, bridge have different IP ranges on each host to prevent conflicts. So, obviously there's multiple versions um, of this. You can, you can go and explore some of those via the links. Um, it's important to understand what's basically happening with Docker. Docker has allowed plugins for this networking because it knows that one size does not fit all. So all of these networking plugins for Docker, which all of them I've just described are, um, care about one thing. They care about what do I do to network this new container and how do I make sure I can talk to the other hosts that are meant to be in this cluster if you're not just running one device. Um, and the simple way of doing that is Docker exposes a plugin interface. Um, these networking agents register with that plugin interface, and then Docker just stops doing the default host networking. It stops doing, you know, instead of giving us that bridge, um, when Docker creates a container, it effectively says to this networking agent that we're now running on the same host, which is registered with the Docker plugin, hey, network this container for me. It's a new container. And then the networking agent can do whatever it wants. It can run either the IPNS commands that, that we ran in the manual example. It can network that container however it wants. And then it tells Docker when it's done and goes, yep, yeah, I've networked that container. Here's the IP address I've picked out of my own IPAM solution. Here's how I'm addressing it. There you go. And then Docker just saves that network information and keeps it with the container. So um, network plugins are actually very, very simple. Um, and to the point that they need not be software. Uh, for example, the ACI plugin for um, Kubernetes allows you basically to have Kubernetes spin up containers, uh, very similar to the, the single host Docker examples we did early, and then speak down to ACI and make sure the bridge group that we are saying in the when we're running the container, we want it in this um, EPG, make sure that EPG exists. And if so, um, VLAN tag that um, traffic from that Docker container so that it goes directly out onto the ACI fabric um, and the ACI fabric understands that that is coming from this container with this its own IP address and effectively through VXLAN that container has a virtual port in the um, ACI fabric which allows you to track all of your containers effectively in the same physical networking as your VMs, your bare metal servers. You don't have ships in the night through all these different um, interfaces. So yeah, do not have to be, um, do not have to be hardware. You know that is the flexibility to have a network plugin go and run whatever commands and talk to whatever third-party data stores and state stores and you know third-party APIs you want to implement your your preferred networking solution. So another example of this is Calico. Um, Calico by default um, actually does routing and it does routing dynamically. So Calico doesn't just install its own agent um, to run the commands to set up the network namespace and the container. Um, it actually installs open source bird BGPD on each of your nodes as well. Um, the network, the Calico agent uses state to make sure that if you add a new host to your cluster, um, new BGP peers get set up automatically um, from all the other bird BGP instances, and it basically means that it then doesn't have to manually configure routes on each of your nodes. Um, BGP takes care of that. It also means that if you ever needed to move um, containers or services with a certain IP, so they were the, another host was responsible for them, because you're running BGP, obviously you can re-advertise that IP address um, on a different host, and that will carry on working, rather than the simple different bridges with different subnets 
um, solution in Flannel, which is very, very static. And if you have to retire a host um, and you had service IPs maybe tied to that host, you're probably not going to be able to reuse those IPs without some manual intervention. So uh, Calico by default was BGP. It will fall back to tunneling if need be, if there's no direct communication between the hosts. Um, but yes, quite cool because you can integrate it in an on-prem environment directly with your top of rack switches. So you could, if you're running BGP through your data center, um, Calico can actually add those containers directly onto your data center rooted fabric. And I've been talking about these plugins and the fact that these are all just a plugin solution that Docker will say, hey, um, go and network this container for me. There's one other thing you will you know, want to be wary of, um, understand what it means, and that's CNI. You'll hear it when you start looking at um, orchestrators. So you're never really going to run Docker run commands on a bunch of hosts. It's good for building containers. It's good for your development pipelines. Um, but realistically, you're going to use a container orchestrator in production to have a group of hosts with a single API to go, hey, run five of these containers across X number of these nodes for me. Um, without having to manually jump on those nodes and do S, you know, Docker run, et cetera, et cetera. And so CNI is a standard for networking plugins that's supported by pretty much every network orchestrator you can think of, including Kubernetes, OpenShift, Cloud Foundry. Um, Docker itself uses a different plugin mechanism, which is annoying, um, but CNI is the one that realistically you're going to be looking for if you want to use one of these existing uh, public um, networking solutions for containers. Um, our Contiv ACI plugin has a CNI interface, uh, as does Calico, as does Weave, as does Flannel. Um, so all the ones I've talked about are usable. And CNI, you can go and read about it. It's very, very simple. It's literally the orchestrator version of here is how you need to package your networking solution and the commands and the agent that you want to run on the host in order for us to go, I need to create a new container. I'm going to tell you to network it, you do whatever you want to do, and then give me the information back. So implementing network plugins is all done through CNI. And an extension of CNI is something called a network policy. And as I said earlier, we're very used to Kubernetes, uh, sorry, we're very used to IP tables in the container space, um, very used to IP tables in the container space being used to not only allow NAT and access, you know, services, but also to uh, restrict network policies. Can A access B for multi-tenant environments? Can these containers access these containers? Can these containers access that external service? Um, network policies are a part of Kubernetes where you can kind of describe the those access rules in a more standardized way than manually going in and adding IP tables rules on your host. So you can effectively say when you create a um, a Kubernetes, a container within Kubernetes as an orchestrator, hey, this container is never allowed to contact anything other than this external service on this port. Um, and network policies are executed by the CNI plugin as well. Not all CNI plugins like the basic ones like Flannel, uh, the older versions, not all of them support network policy. Um, so if you have a CNI plugin that doesn't, obviously it's not going to enforce any of these rules, but things like Calico, certainly things like the uh, Cisco ACI plugin for CNI, um, they will all implement um, security. So Calico will use IP tables by default. Obviously ACI is a hardware um, kind of networking fabric anyway, so that security will be implemented directly in ACI. And it's, res it's the responsibility of the CNI plugin, just like Docker said, hey, plugin, network this container for me. Um, it's the same when there is a network policy attached in Kubernetes. It will reach out to its CNI plugin and go, hey, enforce this security for me. It doesn't care how it does it. It's the responsibility of the CNI plugin uh, with network policies to make that happen. And so as I've already kind of covered, um, I would really suggest if you're interested in kind of the ACI integration and kind of seeing more deeply on how a CNI plugin can literally do anything, be it software, be it reach out to external APIs and services. Um, season one, episode seven was a deep dive 
into the ACI CNI plugin for integrating um, ACI with containers and Kubernetes. Um, goes into a load more detail, probably is the next place to expand your kind of container networking understanding. So definitely go and check that out. You can watch that straight after this video if you wanted to. Um, it's available online. And then very, very quickly, before we wrap up, I'm just going to cover a couple of industry developments, maybe things for your own learning to, to go forward. Um, so first of all, kind of things in completely software environments like Calico in the cloud, um, where it's implementing all these network policies and NAT rules using IP tables, um, you might have a thousand containers running on a single host or a single VM. So having to have every packet traverse through a thousand rules and NAT and everything else in IP tables um, was beginning to impact performance quite critically in um, highly used environments of people running Kubernetes. Um, there is a function within the Linux kernel called eBPF, and it basically allows you to create your own scripts that run when triggered by incoming or outgoing network traffic within the kernel themselves. And not having to jump from kernel to user space um, is a massive performance gain. Anything in user space via the kernel, so data traffic coming in via the kernel via a network or a virtual network, and then up into a process and then back down, um, every time you cross that user space kernel space boundary in Linux, you incur a penalty. So being able to do a load of custom scripting inside the kernel in a safe manner, um, which doesn't allow you know the kernel to be compromised, is actually hugely valuable. And people are starting to use eBPF to support some of the rules instead of IP tables in high performance environments. Um, it can also be used for getting like real time counters. Um, of specific packets and specific interfaces because you're down in the kernel where you can do a lot more computation a lot quicker on kind of millions of incoming packets a second. So eBPF and its use in Kubernetes, um, Google for using eBPF in Kubernetes, lovely article there uh, that kind of explains the state of the art going on there for high performance environments. Um, and a few other things to think about. Um, we're starting to see more and more people want to do federated Kubernetes, controlling multiple Kubernetes or container orchestrator clusters from a single place uh, to do kind of multi-cloud or to do hybrid um, in an easy way. And that's going to bring some really interesting networking scenarios for Kubernetes. If I have two Kubernetes clusters on two different clouds that I'm feel like managing as if they are one through federated Kubernetes, what does that mean for my CNI plugins? What does that mean for ease of use for a customer? There's potentially some value there in things like SD-WAN, um, auto VPN, and how we could make the user experience, um, which we already have through CNI for single locations, um, really, really good for kind of these edge fog remote location workloads. That's quite an exciting area. Um, state of the art that, that needs looking into in the container space and you as networkers are perfectly placed to kind of jump in and you know not reinvent the wheel and, and kind of look at those uh, really interesting network architecture use cases. So to sum up we've talked quite extensively about Linux networking and how Linux networking is pretty much all you need to know about container networking. We've covered namespaces and vs which are kind of the two main building blocks uh, we've looked at how that scales to multiple hosts and some of the tools that can automate that for you rather than going it alone. And we've briefly covered the CNI um, standard um, that people write these plugins in so that they can be consumed by Kubernetes and Docker Swarm and all of the other container orchestrators you can think of. If you want to learn more about containers, uh, about container networking, um, got some excellent resources for you on Cisco DevNet. We have our microservices and containers intro DevNet module, which goes through what are Docker containers, how to build your own, how to save them, how to share them, how to kind of use them in production. We also have a Kubernetes CNI ACI sandbox that if you go and look at season one's um, recommended webinar on um, NetDevOps Live, that will be a really, really useful sandbox to go and explore that webinar with, get your hands dirty, kind of see how that CNI plugin is interacting. And then every command I ran at the start of this webinar um, is on GitHub for you to download and run against a bog standard um, Ubuntu VM um, with the Docker uh, community edition installed. 
and there at the link there, NetDevops Live 0213. And then finally, as always, there's the NetDevops Live Code Exchange Challenge. This one is possibly, you know, if you've not done these before and you want to get started with one, this is potentially the easiest one. Um, we'd like you to take your favorite network automation script that you couldn't live without, the one you use to debug your environment, the one you, you really find valuable, and you've probably given it to a load of other people around your, your team. Um, we want you to document and containerize that so that it's really easy for me to go docker run um, your cool script and that docker container will download and I will be able to run that script myself um, and you know maybe benefit a load more people with these wonderful day-to-day um, -day debugging scripts that uh, you as the kind of you know automation networking architects are, are coming up with. So please include a doc file in the repo, um, install any dependencies for whatever you're using, it might be Python, it might be a simple bash script, um, and please do submit that to Code Exchange. Um, we'd be really, really interested to see, uh, to see what you come up with there. And then obviously the whole Net of DevOps Live wealth of information, um, season two, episode 13 speaks for itself, um, so many great topics outside of containers and you know network automation in general please do go and check them out if this is your first one um, or just go and look at other devnet um, net devops resources at developer.cisco.com slash net devops um, you can also find net devops related blogs on cisco blogs um, and if you haven't already do go and check out our programmability basics uh, video course by the wonderful hank preston um, at the link below and so that's all from me. Um, please do stay in touch. Any questions that we may not have time for here, I'll, I'll certainly uh, read the ones you've left in the room and get back to you if you've left uh, contact details. But if not, I'm at Matt-J on Twitter. Um, my GitHub is there. And you know, please do, uh, please do stay in touch or ping me with any questions. And thank you very much for your time today. Excellent. Thanks so much, Matt. Today's session was really a great cap off to season two. Um, it was a huge deep dive. I cannot believe how much and how clearly you went through all of the intricacies of both Linux and container networking in today's session. And I hope everybody uh, enjoyed it live as well as all the folks that are going to be able to watch this video as soon as we get it posted. All right, with that, season two for NetDevOps Live is over and it's in the books. Uh, stay tuned for more details on what comes next. And until then, we'll talk to you soon online. Thanks, everybody.